This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E dot com. He's Bill, already- start the mill started a minute ago where I said, have it start right where I said that Yanni, if, if he would kill his daughter to make a bigger buck. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll pick so, up where so we need to be. Now you're saying that uh, my daughter is of equivalent value to a stand of oaks. No, the point I'm making is or an individual in, your, in your drive to make your Wisconsin property a big buck heaven. To make it part of the whitetail industrial complex, you're willing. Okay, you're, you're already mischaracterizing. You're what I'm willing doing. to sacrifice. You're willing to sacrifice these poor trees that have been there a long time. All would 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 you uh, would you say that um, you would be a happy hunter if everyone managed their oak stands to look like a hundred year old park? I don't understand the question. Put it in terms of me killing my children. <clears throat> I, I, that's not how my brain works. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is hunting in America would be extremely different if everything looked how you want it to look. I understand. I understand. What I'm trying to prevent him from doing is chopping them all down and not, and not leaving some amount of them up. I already told you. I'm leaving some amount of them up. What percent? Less than 10. <laughs> Low stem density. Slicker down, Yanni. That's what I say. Just, so, just to bring people up to speed who are joining us today, um, Yanni's been trying to develop a, how many acres? 40. He's trying to develop 40 acres of Wisconsin hardwood into, uh, in, into a little deer nest. And in doing this, he's going to- Wildlife nest. And in doing this, he's going to kill all kinds of oaks, which here's the thing that strikes me. Here's why this is upsetting to me. (laughs) My dear mother, who still lives in the house I grew up in, Mm -hmm. um, that yard, our yard where I grew up, was, when I was a boy, was just giant oaks. Mm -hmm. Bunch, probably 10, I don't know, giant oaks. And then uh, over the years, they have, out of expediency, oftentimes for uh, as frivolous of a concern is leaf raking mm. and stick picking up, they have pretty much eradicated the oaks, as has, as has been a general movement all around that lake. So where once from the air, it was just an oak canopy in squirrel heaven has been, there's just this movement to like, get rid of all these big, beautiful trees, not mm-hmm. for deer management. So when I hear people chopping down all the trees, I, like, I go to a kind of a lower ax place. Yeah, but you got to picture all the trees that are going to be there. After everyone's dead. After, yeah. after to, the harvest. You have to look to the future. And That's all one the thing that does gonna, excite that me is when there. all humans are gone. You know, because we won't, right? Yep. Just how crazy the earth is going to get when it rebuilds in a few million years. It'll be good deer hunting. <laughs> <laughs> or some yeah. other kind of well, animal. No, because we'll be known to chop all the big trees down. I get timber well, no, management. That... I get timber management. I just, I just, I'll, I'm going to move on from the subject. I just want you to <clears throat> just be delicate and, and, and be delicate. Nature, listen, if we all die tomorrow, every, all the humans are gone, nature is going to come through. With a big windstorm, knock all those damn oaks over anyway. Well, we, and it's going to regenerate, and, and a, a fire is going to come through and burn that. Mm-hmm. It's just going to get back to its normal fire cycle. Yanni's just kind of mimicking that through a timber harvest. Yeah, it's interesting. I grew up in a place, and that's exactly what it is. There's been no management whatsoever. Lots of old oaks, but lots of big windstorms, and it's just a jungle now. But the deer love it. Yeah, I mean, it's a deer <laughs> Perfect magnet. bedding area. Yeah. Paul, would you like to introduce? You've been on the show before. I have been on your when show. When was the last Steve? time? Paul Neese from Vortex yeah. Office is joining us Yeah, glad us to today. be here. Paul's probably one of the first. 
way back. It would be first way back. I, I can't even show. remember what the topics would have been we were talking about. But oh, that was back in the day when we were like, that. let's discuss rifle scopes and how they work. Probably, that's yeah, that's on. exactly what it was. Oh, I'm still, yeah, I'm still Paul, pull, that. pull your mic up Wait. just a little bit higher on your. There you go. That sound better? Yeah. I right. level with your mustache. As it, such as it is. It's this right here. Hello. Two fingers. There you go. All right. Jason Phelps is with us today. Glad pull your, to be here. Pull your mic up, too. Oh, jeez. Yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> yep. Coos deer hunting in the rain. Joined as well by Starbucks apologist Matt Cook. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about that. <laughs> glad to be here. I still got some things to say about that. I could get upset all over again. <laughs> and uh, Giannis and Seth. Um, I could bore you guys. Well, yeah. Do you really want to do that? No, I'm not going to bore you with that. But here's something interesting Thank that you. someone wrote in about. So we recently had the agriculturist, Will Agriculturist, speaking of land management, Will Harris. Were you there when Will Harris was on the show? No, sir. Um, He runs a large regenerative regener he we, we discussed with him regenerative agriculture what that means and some of the practices that go into it and he talked about uh they run a slaughter plant on their oh farm. yeah 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 no what was it last oak no white oak white oak pastures, white oak pastures. White oak pastures. yeah, yeah not, not like uh brush pastures white oak pastures mm-hmm. but you know you got to kill a lot of white oaks to have pasture underneath mm -hmm. oaks um <laughs> Will Harris from White Oak Pastures go. was on, and he was talking about their uh, his this, this grand scale experiment of trying to create a farm where you minimize uh, you minimize what comes you you try to have more individual control of what comes in and what goes off of the place to the point where they are running their own inspected slaughter plant for the livestock that they sell. They sell much of it direct to consumer. And then they also are doing their own composting of the uh, guts and guts and everything off their own livestock. What's the word I'm looking for? You don't say guts if you're a livestock man. Awful. The viscera. Awful. 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 They're composting their own awful. And so they have they use heavy equipment. And they use wood chips and other things, and they're able to, after the slaughter, they'll take all of the non-usable animal remains and compost them on site and then use that compost on site. A gentleman wrote in, uh, and this is fitting. Dirt, you were talking about doing a shot of The Last Supper. Can you still pull that off? Dirt's back here. Oh, Dirt, while you're doing that, um, I'm going to share with listeners a, a thing that Dirt shared with me. Uh, who was not present when Dirt discussed his grandfather's chapstick of choice? Oh, I, yeah, I was there. <laughs> not present? <laughs> not present. Not present. Not present. Okay. Present. Now, I'm going to give you three guesses as to what Dirt's grandfather liked for chapstick. Like, how wild do we have to go? <laughs> as in flavor? <laughs> Just, it ain't chapstick. Beef towel. And it ain't for sale at the store. Beef towel? Uh, no. Oh, not for sale. I think story. you can give him a, a farther hint. There's too many. His uh, body uh, produces it. Oh, oh no. Earwax. Yes. <laughs> Dirt's grandfather. Oh, goodness. Would <laughs> like, yeah, would dig his own earwax wow, out of goodness. his ear and apply it as chapstick. <laughs> I don't he know. Must, I, the fact he must that have I very that productive ears. That that is like, Listen, wow. I tried it yesterday. It wasn't Yo. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Good shiny lips all day. Yeah, oh. that made a ton of sense. Did you get the uh. shot of the last supper? God, that's why I want to key that up. <laughs> so this gentleman writes in, what's this guy's name? Uh, doesn't really matter. Stephen from Illinois. Stephen from Illinois writes in. As he was listening to our guest talking about composting animals on his own site, he uh, it reminded him of a Bible verse. He says an old Bible verse, but uh, all Bible verses are old. Um. If someone shows you a new Bible verse, be skeptical. An old Bible verse. Any Israelite or any foreigner residing among you who hunts any animal or bird that may be eaten must drain out the blood and cover it with the earth. Leviticus 17, 13. 
Um, and he thought about that as he's talking about Will Harris talking about uh, spreading out the guts and covering them with earth. And he wants to know, is this a good practice? And he says, perhaps it's not lawful in some areas to dig dirt up and cover your gut pile. But he's wondering, um, you know, where that comes from. Biblically, does it strike someone as a good thing when you get done uh, cutting up an animal in the field that you would go out and cover it with dirt? And is that legal? I have never heard of any restrictions on covering up your gut pile with dirt. The only con I could think of is that usually, um, well, you know what? In some places you have to. Right, probably have yeah, to. What? I mean, in condor, but, don't you uh, have to in condor recovery areas? Aren't you supposed to cover your? No, am I making this up? Because of the lead. Hmm. Yeah, potentially that's probably why that would have been. I'm okay. sure. Am I making this up? Cover, There's a place you're supposed uh, to cover your gut pile, bury your gut pile. I haven't it, heard maybe. it. Don't know. I've no, I think it. there's somewhere where there was for a while, maybe before the lead ban in the condor recovery area, you were actually tasked with covering, burying your gut pile. However, I've never heard any restrictions on it. Yanni will now in times, uh, uh, I don't know if you still do this, he will drape the hide over just to leave it seeming tidy. Just, I would to, think, just to make the coyotes work for it. I would think a negative would be, in doing this, a negative would be um, that you know raptors will dine on that, and if you're covering it with dirt, maybe you make their job a little bit harder, but it's definitely not going to go to waste. But then he gets into a lot of this other stuff that I've discussed before about why are there so many references in the Bible to trapping and, and talking about other, um, other biblical verses that reference hunting. So Proverbs, who, who can tell me what Proverbs 12, 27? Nobody. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> lazy people, hear this, lazy people, don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. Hmm? Hmm? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. Now he goes on to say this. I'll, I'll provide some insight on this in a minute. Amos, I didn't even know that was part of the... Amos? Amos? 3-5? Does... It's a rhetorical question, I gather. Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when no bait is there? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has not caught anything? Psalms 91.3. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. Proverbs 1.17. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. Proverbs 6.5. Free yourself. Like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. And then uh, 1 First Samuel 26, 20. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Isaiah 51, 20. Your children have fainted. They lie at every street corner like antelope caught in a net. And lastly, Ecclesiastes 9.12. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Think all that, Seth. I know uh, several times in Pennsylvania, I've come back to a gut pile from a deer I've killed, and it's been covered up by a bobcat, so maybe they're doing the Lord's work out there. There you go. Uh, all this netting. So I had, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I'll revisit it. I had occasion one time to go to a thing called, uh, are you familiar with the Chabad house, Matt? You're a worldly fella. I am. Yeah. Yep. You've, been, you've spent time with the Israelites. Uh, no, but there's in downtown Chicago. Okay. Yep. So a friend of mine was Jewish and we went to this thing called the Chabad house. And basically it's where reformed, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this in the way that the Chabad probably would not characterize it. It's like, it's a, it's a Jewish 
it's a it's like a Jewish fundamentalist organization that tries to recruit reformed or laxed Jews. So they're not proselytizing to Gentiles. They're like proselytizing to Jews who aren't um, practicing. Okay. So they would they had zero interest in me as a gen they, like a Chabad dude would have zero interest in me <laughs> as a as a gentile. You don't bring anything to the there's, table. Yeah, uh, there's, there's, it's no, like no, I'm not there. It's yeah, like I'm not there. Yeah. But I'm with my friend who's a reformed Jew, and you get to ask these people questions. And uh, she was researching a book is why she was there. So I was just there hanging out, and I was saying because we're talking about dietary law from the Old Testament. So Old Testament dietary law gets into a lot of things like. Um, that's where, you know, you'll say like, the, the, don't eat pork. Okay. And so everybody says, well, yeah, of course the Bible says don't eat pork because you could get trichinosis. But if you ask, uh, if, if you ask one of these scholars, why does the Bible say don't eat pork? Is it because of trichinosis? They would say, you don't know. We don't know why God said don't eat pork. Don't speak for God. It's a mystery why he, like, he doesn't say why he doesn't want you to eat pork. Don't eat pork. If he said it was because of if it was because of trichinosis, he would say that's what it is. You don't know why. So there's a dietary prohibition. Like if you if you follow the Old Testament, if you follow it literally, um, you know, like you don't gamble. You definitely don't gamble. Um, you don't eat shrimp. So no no shellfish, no fish without scales, no animals um, that don't have a cloven hoof, which rules out hogs. It rules out horse meat. Definitely rules out coyotes. Um, an array of insects you're not supposed to eat. And he just lays out like, here's what my people eat. And here's what my people don't eat. One of the things that when for, for you to eat an animal, if you follow the Bible, literally, um, if you eat an animal that there's a ritualistic way that the animal needs to be killed with a cut to the throat with a certain type of blade. So you'll see references often to netting animals. Because you can net an animal, you could catch a wild animal and still do ritualistic slaughter to make it kosher. So I was asking him, how could you have, how could you eat wild game as an observant Jew or as an observant Christian who observes the Old Testament? And he said, you'd have to catch it in a net. And then you can catch it in a net because because the slaughterer needs to be able to inspect the animal. And not only that, they need to be able to inspect the viscera. So if you have a cash root, cash root, K-A-S-H-R-U-T, if you do cash root slaughter, when they have rabbis that they'll gut the animal and pull the lungs out and see if it has any lesions or anything, because they're, they're, they're playing it so safe with God that they're like, God says don't eat carrion, okay? So that's another descriptor. If you follow the Old Testament, literally, and no one does, but if you did, uh, if you follow the Old Testament literally, you would not be able to eat roadkill because you wouldn't be able to ascertain the health of the animal. No one inspected the health of the animal. So some people who are super fundamentalists play it so safe, uh, play it so safe with God that they would be like, not only do I not want to eat carrion, I don't want to eat something that may have had a close brush with death and then lived. So you'll take a perfectly healthy looking animal and they'll still pull its lungs to see if it has any lesions from past ailments that might have made it that like it almost was dead. So you're like you're you're hedging your bets. I'm I'm starting to really question eating elk with hoof rot and deer that survive C W D and I No. No. You will, should, yeah. you will be struck down. Probably should revisit them. <laughs> Question for you. So is it anything that is, you know, you catch the animal live, I mean, netting, not literally, but if there was a live trap. Yes, you could do it. Okay. You could be... You, you, have, could, to, you have to be the one that kills it. You could follow Old yep. Testament... You could follow Old Testament dietary law um, and catch a deer in a net, which is going to get you in trouble with your state fish and game agency, but... The, <laughs> You got to sort of go like, what, what matters more, like law of God or law of man, right? And the Bible will also advise you on, on where the hierarchy of law falls. Um, and it would say the law of God sits above the law of man. So if you were trying to follow the Bible, you could catch a deer in a net and then do the 
the proper slaughter in the proper way and that meat would be fine. It's not that there's a problem with the meat in and of itself. It's the process of delivering it to the plate. And then, of course, you couldn't mix it with milk. Like, you can't eat meat and cheese together because the Bible says don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. So to play it extra safe, you don't mix milk and meat. Even the milk is different than the animal that you're mixing it with, meaning don't yeah. Dairy so milk they're like, I don't milk. know. You'd be like, I don't exactly know what God meant, okay. but don't mix milk and cheese. Got it. Don't mix meat and milk in any circumstances. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff, and there's also like, uh, God says, don't shave the corners of your face. And so people have trouble, have been puzzled by what that means. That's why you'll see observant Jews that have the payas that long, because they play it so safe. They're like, not only am I not going to shave my sideburn, I don't really know what he meant. So I'm going to extend that up into my hairline to make sure I'm playing it safe. We're going to get a lot of letters of people who don't like how I'm describing this, but it's fascinating. (laughs) It's a great approach. It'd be like, it's a really great approach to being observant. You'd be like, you take what they said and you extra don't do it. You know? Question for you. Is there any loophole or anyone you've ever seen where, you know, instead of hunting in the traditional way, they're live trapping animals and, you know, preparing the meat and they, in, in the way that you described you know, is there a... I've never heard of it. Okay. I've never heard of any... Interesting if anyone I've never in. heard... I've never seen... I've never heard of game meat being advertised as kosh root. I think when you look at the food labels, I think it's a, a U, maybe yep. it's a U with a circle around it. Yep. Would tell you that it that it's in a, that it's prepared in accordance with Old Testament dietary law. I just know there's a loophole from a hunting perspective. No. So, okay. Uh, I've never heard of anybody <laughs> exploiting that loophole. Okay. Um, because then you get into this huge, there's a huge element of tradition. For instance, uh, now like shark meat would be generally regarded as not kosher, but now researchers like, it's not the way that they think of a scale. Um, really a shark is scaled, right? So when they look at shark skin, right? The anatomy of shark skin, they're like, uh, arguably it's just, it's, it's, you know, millions of scales that create that skin Smooth feel. It's just yeah. the, the scale in different form. That doesn't mean that people that follow Old Testament dietary law rushed out to buy shark meat. Mm. And what, what, There's would, like a tradition what, would, what would have forbidden shark meat? I missed that part of it. What was the... No, no scale is fish. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. I wish uh, that my kids would take the same approach to uh, listening to my parenting. Mm. They're like, I don't want to upset dad, so, so I'm going to be extra safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not going to happen. That'd be great. Yeah, it's like, you know, dad gets mad about the candy. So, in fact, I'm cutting out some sugars that would traditionally have been okay. <laughs> I don't want to make my dad mad. Speaking of kids the other day, I had a long time ago told my kids the story of how the teddy bear came to be, like how the why teddy bears are teddy bears. And it involves, of course... Teddy Roosevelt opting not to shoot a a black bear that a that a freed slave a former slave and hunting guide named Holt Collier had lassoed and tied to a tree. Teddy Roosevelt opts not to shoot the bear. A sad, not, a weird part of the story that never gets told is like they killed the bear anyways. He didn't kill, it, but they still killed the bear because it was all messed up. They always leave that out of the telling. Anyways, I was asking my kids. I'm like, hey, remember when I told you the story of how the teddy bear got its name? tell me that story back. And my eight-year-old is telling me the story back. And he says, he doesn't remember the name Holt Collier, but he says, and then the hunting guide called Teddy Roosevelt. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, he called him? Placed a phone call to Teddy Roosevelt. (laughs) Uh, Here's a a study that just came out that's interesting. The, the, The headline, study finds Bigfoot sightings correlate with black bear populations. Surprise, surprise. That's interesting. I got an email. I'll, I'll give you a little more, then I'll tell you about an, a, a thing that they're looking at too. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll prelude it by saying this. Um, 
a, a guy just wrote, a journalist just wrote in, he wanted to like quote an article that was at themediator.com about gunfire and hearing loss. And it's, uh, you know how I used to have all these ideas that turned out to be wrong? Like I thought left-wing people were far more likely to be gluten intolerant than right-wing people. <laughs> and I thought left-wing people were far more likely to believe in ghosts than right-wing people, both of which are not true. Um, <laughs> right-wing people are far more likely to suffer hearing, or more likely to suffer hearing loss. That makes sense. Has to be gunfire. Of course. Or just running heavy equipment, doing <laughs> Pro you know, two-way. harder, yeah, heavy, all the work, heavy yeah, work, yeah. yeah, rural. And it was like, there's like a rural overlap yeah. within that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ag equipment, yeah. chainsaws, <laughs> loud-ass motorcycles with no mufflers. <laughs> <Loud motorcycles. laughs> yeah. Dirt mufflers on them. Yeah. Yeah. souped up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this guy wrote in, and he was exploring the gunfire aspect of hearing loss among the right. Uh, so th- this article, I can't even tell where this came from. Ars Technica? What the hell is that? ARS Technica? I don't want to do these guys wrong. What does that mean? ARS Technica? I've seen that before as a publication or a online, online. We're in Mexico getting our asses kicked. Oh, yeah, Ars Technica. Um, ARS Technica. I haven't heard of this news source. Anyways, that's the news source. The idea that North America is home to completely unknown primate species just doesn't seem to go away. Lord, it does not. Years, I'm reading. Years after everyone started walking around with high-quality cameras in their phones, there still haven't been any clear images of a Bigfoot. But that hasn't stopped a steady flow of reported sightings. That, as we've explored in the past, because I like to goof on Bigfoot people, which is, you know, easy pickings, low-hanging fruit. Um, they have come up with this explanation that Bigfoot resides in a dimension that can't, a different dimension. Uh-huh. Not subject to film. Uh, now... Someone named Flo Foxen has followed up on an earlier analysis and checked for factors that could influence the frequency of Bigfoot sightings throughout North America. The results suggest that there's a strong correlation between sightings and the local black bear population. For every 1,000 bears, I'm assuming it's, this is, uh, the frequency of Bigfoot sightings goes up by about 4%. I'm assuming they mean by unit of space. So here's some good stuff. The most recent comprehensive peer-reviewed data on black bear populations dates from 2006. So they're using data from that year. Even so, a number of states and provinces had to be excluded. Um, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota had no known black bear populations in 2006. Um, There's some other states that, that just didn't have adequate numbers on um, didn't have adequate numbers on black bears. So they went and looked ahead and they found that forested areas where you have a, okay. okay it's kind of complicated. They did a really good job of it. Um, overall Fox and found that with forested areas and the human population taken into account, there's about one Bigfoot sighting for every 5,000 black bears. Each additional 1,000 bears raises the probability of a sighting by about 4%. Then they go on to, she's trying to then make some sense out of it. And it could be helpful for bear con, could be helpful for bear conservation. Oh my God. You know, they try to like, (laughs) This is from the Journal of Zoology. You know, they always like, like nowadays, if you want to publish anything, we've talked about this. If you want to publish anything in a newspaper about wildlife, you, if you link it to climate change, it'll be in there, right? Anything. A, gri- a polar bear attacks a person, climate change. I thought that was shot down after we brought that up. Didn't a bunch of people write in and say that wasn't it? Was no, that, that was talking about, that was talking about in journal entries, but I'm saying that like, you could take any freak wildlife thing, any freak wildlife thing, and you'll, in the end, link it to climate change. So here this person is saying, here this person is saying, this is nothing to do with climate change. The person is saying that this could be great for, quote, whatever this means, quote, bear conservation. As the frequency of Bigfoot sightings may provide a proxy measure for the number of black bears (laughs) present. (laughs) 
and thus could provide an independent method of tracking population changes. Or, or you just wasted a ton of time. <laughs> <laughs> <More likely. laughs> they got done and they showed it to, they got done with their paper and they showed it to their friend and their friend said that's the stupidest thing I've read in years and then they're like shit you're right <laughs> this could be helpful for bear con instead of measuring <laughs> instead of having all these stupid biologists out measuring bear populations what we could do instead is we'll set up a Bigfoot hotline and then we'll take incoming calls to the Bigfoot hotline and model them out to find out how many bears are on the landscape. And if we see a reduction in Bigfoot hotline calls, that wouldn't mean something to do with education, drug use, the rise and fall of hippie shit. It would be that bear numbers are down. <laughs> so when they set quotas, you'll be like, the, the bear manager will be like, uh, you know what? We got uh, Montana's Region 3 had zero Bigfoot sightings this year. Uh, no tag allocation this year. It seems that the bears are gone. <laughs> this is the dumbest thing I've ever read. I didn't even know it was dumb till the end. Add, add, have them add in to look at uh, whether there's more uh, sightings during a democratic presidency or a republican presidency that would be good a good overlay and the other thing mm -hmm. is is what about areas that have high black bear density in different color phases um oh uh, yeah that could mess it up here's one we have a guest we're working on getting a guest on to talk about we're getting a guest on to talk about the public land costs the cost to public land um with industrial scale utility utility scale wind and solar development um the guest we're working on is involved in um is involved in offshore wind development uh not involved in it as a stakeholder but involved in it as a person measuring environmental impact and uh by i think it's by is it 20 um i can't remember what the projection is since they can't remember the projection i don't want to say it we don't have great internet where we're at in mexico right now um tens of thousands of offshore tens of thousands of offshore wind units um along the east along the atlantic shoreline by 2050 or whatever the hell six thousand by 2030 right so a, a couple things um what does that mean for all that increased disturbance around construction but also what does it mean for fish habitat and a great parallel is you'd go and look at what oil development in the gulf of mexico wound up doing for the fishery i mean it created a fishery right like department it's sort of the, the department of un unforeseen consequences is um uh there was all that disturbance all that development no doubt all kinds of you know probably very negative impact on bivalves and all this other stuff but in cert with certain reef fish it caused this long-term explosion in reef fish populations so we're going to have a guest on to talk about offshore wind and what offshore wind looks like and what are you getting out of it um short-term impacts long-term impacts what fish hate it what fish will love it and sort of what your future is going to look like as we develop offshore wind. But this is a plan. This is, it's widely reported, but we're looking at Montana free press here about the BLM unveiling a plan for utility scale solar developments in Western States on your public lands. Um, we're going to dive into that in greater detail later, but, uh, we're talking about massive amounts of land. Massive amounts of land that you currently hunt um, could potentially be uh, um, could potentially be developed. So, if the BLM selects, there's this thing, different alternatives. One of these alternatives, uh, 
eight million acres of so this let, let's focus on montana for a minute just so we're looking at a montana free press but this is widespread across the west but just an example in montana um out of eight million acres of blm managed land in montana uh two hundred ten thousand acres could become available for solar developments um most of that stuff deemed suitable for solar development sits north of what's called the high line um so if you if you look at the high line generally it's like the string of towns um, highway two. north highway two yeah. so highway two you the high line used to be a railroad line but two runs so you, you had the um what's the one what's the main rail line the the I-90 rail, like the 90-94 rail line. What's it called? Northern Pacific. The Northern Pacific bisects the state east to west, and then you had the High Line, which is another rail line in the north, and eventually Highway 2 followed that. So they're saying that of that, the BLM could develop 210,000 acres for putting solar developments on that land. Um there's a bunch of land that's out of the question because it's too far from high voltage transmission lines. Um, and then the 7.3 million acres, okay, have been deemed ill-suited. This is just in one state, mind you. So the vast majority, 7.3 million acres, ill-suited for reasons ecological, reasons historical, reasons cultural, and reasons recreational my fear with all this my fear with all this is uh and we're gonna we're gonna get into this with a with a with a specialized guest who again focuses on offshore my fear with all this is that we do this wind and solar development and if you go look like have you ever seen that map if you're gonna power great britain with current wind and solar technologies what the hell was it 70 you have to cover 74 percent of it with wind and solar. I can't remember what. I might be a little bit off. But if you're going to do that, Great Britain, you'd have to cover, I think, I don't know what the hell it is, 74% of available, of non-developed lands would need to be converted with current technology. My fear is that we go through with this um, kind of stuff, but it's not a local problem. It's a global issue. We go through with this, and then China, India, right? Uh, these parts of the world, also Africa, where population is growing, right? In places, it's growing exponentially over time. Um, that we go through with this and we trash, we trash our like our remaining bits of undeveloped lands. Globally, we don't see any kind of transition, and then down the road, you see that temperature gradually increases and we'd be like well shit if we hadn't have done any of that um it made no difference and now as we try to create landscape wide room for species to develop and adapt and colonize new areas and change their habits in accordance with warmer weather that we've trashed those landscapes and globally this idea never caught on and it made it was a drop in the bucket, made zero difference, and all we've come out of it with is we've developed the areas that we're going to need for resiliency, no matter what the hell happens in the future. Meaning, let's say the temperature is going to climb two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Wildlife still needs a place to be, and if you're not going to prevent it from happening, you head you need to hedge your bets by having big intact ecosystems, right? Like create room for wildlife to find a way forward but if you destroy all your wildlife habitat trying to curb a thing that you can't curb because one it's more complicated than we think it is or two it would take a global effort that, that there's not enough willpower there in the developing world to follow through with that we just screw ourselves and nothing changes anyways i'll hand it over have you have you heard elon talk about what we would need for a solar grid to power the entire u.s like Per, per our current power usage. No, I haven't. Yeah, he said 101 square miles and your batteries would have to take up one square mile. So like I imagine, and not to put it off on New Mexico, Arizona, but you find like a 10 by 10, like dedicate that and then you just put your 100 square miles of solar, or, you know, 
panels out there and you're done with this whole mess. No more wind. 100 square miles would do what? Would power the entire U.S. grid right now as is. And you would need batteries that hold a one square mile. So literally Come 10 on. miles. I, he's smarter at this <clears throat> battery stuff than me. I remember him saying, I just looked it up. Well, a 10 mile like, by 10 mile. Oh, one continuous panel. Uh, j- just, yeah, whatever current technology, inch, yeah. you put whatever you need to on that 100 squ- and one uh, square miles. And then you feed all these batteries that need their uh, an entire square mile. And uh, bam, you don't have any more of these windmills. You don't have any more of this offshore stuff. It's like, not saying that we need to do it to New Mexico or Arizona, but I'm like, man, there's a lot of... But if you were, what Steve just said, though, is that from what he's reading, it's going to take 70% of the land mass to pull it off, not 100 square miles. Uh, that's no, that was, was to power that, Great Britain. That so just, right I wish I could pull up. See, that's that. where I think we're so expand, you know, and then I don't know. I just ask, the, ask your expert that. Matt, pull up that stat. You're probably good at searching up stuff on the internet, aren't you? Let me take a look. I'm one of the best. You know I what? still have a good signal. I, like you know, my concern is like, the idea of putting solar in these public spaces is kind of more lubricated than putting drilling or oil. Like, I mean, it, it could have as as bad of an effect on migration. You get, yeah, you get public buy-in. You know, there's goodwill around Because people it. feel like they're doing a good thing. 60 Minutes had, a couple of weeks ago, had a, a, a feature on it, and it was a goodwill story. And it showed standing up, looking at a public land where this massive solar field would go. And in my mind, you know, uh, people are very concerned about, you know, natural gas and oil drilling for migration. Why would they not be concerned about the same thing? Because with the it masses? puts them at odds. It puts them, it makes this it sticky. Con- it puts you at odds with yourself. That's exactly right. Because on one hand, me. you're sort of like, you're a habitat, you, you believe in habitat conservation. And many people who are very concerned about habitat conservation, there's a crossover, are very concerned about energy. Yep. And so you kind of go like, oh, okay, buddy. Um... I get it. You're a big environmentalist. You think we should be moving away from fossil fuels. How about we go over to your little spot, your little honey hole, and develop that for alternative energy? And then you got to be like, yeah, I better stay consistent and say that it's okay. This story, you know, was meant to create, like, we found an exciting alternative. But it's putting solar fields in places that everyone has been very concerned about you know, from an energy perspective, you know, disrupting migration corridors, et cetera, that kind of thing. I would argue that we use eminent domain and eminent domain, large tracts of urban area, uh, seize large tracts of currently developed urban area and sports stadiums for starters and convert those into places. I'd advocate. No I'd... more sports stadiums. <laughs> You know what I see? <laughs> and put only them, solar. Put, put them you, on top you know, golf of course, the industrial warehouses. That's become a new sure. energy. Like there's massive spaces on top of Amazon warehouses. Yeah, why it's are like, we not capping cities? And why are we talking about doing it on? Why are we talking about doing it on undeveloped landscapes? There has to be a way. And I'll tell you what I really think we ought to be doing. What I really like. I'm a big. I'm a big nuclear advocate. People like it's risky. It's all risky. Developing on un- developing undeveloped lands is risky. It's all risky. Just remember, if you take away all those sports stadiums, all those people that love sports and pay attention to that, and are not hunting and fishing, they're gonna. I don't know, you're right. I was just joking about sports. <laughs> <laughs> you get more calls that. about that. Take it back. That's why. That's why I'm like with ski hills. Yeah. With ski hills, I'm like I'm down. You know, I don't like. I hate. Don't I hate more than me trying to turn left and I can't because everybody's going up to the ski hill. Makes me want to just kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> my 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 neighbor, my good buddy, you, you know Pottery Pat. Yeah. Pottery Pat was. He on, doesn't like. He's that. on don't the board of the ski hill. Yeah. Now and then, if I'm trying to turn left on a good powder day, I'll call him. <laughs> I'm like, man, I got a real problem, Pat. I know you're on the board of the ski hill. I can't go left out of my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> you need to figure this out. <laughs> uh, here's, another, here's another sticky one, man. So the King Salmon is headed toward a um this is going to get litigated like holy hell the king salmon of, of the gulf of alaska 
is headed for an ESA listing. Oh, yikes. So the Wild Fish Conservancy is doubling down on its temps. This is a, this is a um, press release. From Salmon State. This is a press release from Salmon State out of Alaska. Um, the Wild Fish Conservancy is doubling down on its attempts to shut down fishing in Alaska without consulting with or speaking to the people they're sledgehammering. You can tell this comes from the perspective of Salmon State. who's trying to protect salmon fisheries. Um, basically, in the big fight over, you know, which turns into a never-ending blame game about who's to blame for salmon. Um, they're they're looking now to shut down. Even um, there's been some shut some shutting down already to occur. Even of troll fishing, troll fishing for salmon, which is like a highly selective salmon fishing deal, um, a hook and line fishery. So. This organization, Salmon State, is um, trying to not only protect wild salmon, protect people whose lives are interconnected with them, and they are uh, fighting some of these salmon closures. But things just do not look. It, it, it's it's one of those deals. Like what? Ha- it's like looking at quail in the southeast. I'm trying to think of other things. Quail in the southeast. Deer on this place we're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> King salmon, and you're like, you look and go, like, what happened? And it's too, you can't say what happened. It's too many things to say what happened. But just king salmon are just hurting. Um, they're hurting. The the weird, uh, of course, they're hurting in the Columbia watershed where you have all these dams. Okay, so you're looking like, well, obviously it's all the dams, but why are king salmon numbers down in non dammed areas? Um, microplastics. <sighs> same reason. Okay, Jason's but why? Down. Yeah, but why aren't coho down? Then why aren't pinks down? It's it's a really complicated. It's really complicated. You can't. There's anything that you bring up. We've had someone on who knows this world really well. It's been a couple of years. Anything you bring up, you're like, yeah, well, it must be this. And you're like, okay, but but then what about this? Sure. Like, it must be this. Okay, why are pink numbers good? Why are we seeing great returns on other salmon species? Like, what is it with kings? Um, it's a different fish. They spend, you know, they'll spend more time in the oceans. Um, a lot of this movement now about a lot of this, a way that people are trying to get these fish, that they're trying to get fisheries shut down is when you yawn to pull on America's heartstrings, there's one animal that's definitely going to do the job. That's Willie. The orca. Mm, mm, yep. Um, which I still call a killer whale. What's, uh, what, does your brother Danny have anything to say about that? He's got lots to say about it. That's one of the primary things he works on. Yeah. What does he what does he think? Death by a thousand cuts. Gotcha. Makes Death sense. by a thousand cuts. Uh warming water definitely does not help. Um <clears throat> Just depletion of fisheries does not help. Um, you know, low herring numbers in areas doesn't help. Dams certainly, you know, certainly don't help. Even areas outside of dams, though, just death by a thousand cuts. Some some level of mystery. We should have someone back on to talk about it in greater detail. Are you saying that the orca, you know, if they start being affected by let you know less food source? Yeah. You know that happened with uh, obviously whale watching in the east with Manhattan. Yep. You know, all of a sudden that got elevated because the whale watching crowd, you know, was having a different experience. With sure. Less people are like, I was fine to watch king salmon blink out, but to hear that an orca is hungry, that's just I put that's where I draw. That's a line exactly in the sand. what happened. In the, that's what happened in the east. People are like, that's that where is, I draw a line in the sand. No one cares about small bait fish until the whales aren't rolling and you're seeing them. Yeah. And then people are like, this is, this is, this cannot, this, is, this, this will cannot, not stand. This will not stand. You know? And so you got to do that. Yep. But, uh, I don't know. And we'll, we'll have to get someone back on. And I know people to get back on and talk about salmon, but, um, 
when you look at like the overall population and the mortality that comes from the troll fishery, it's just such a drop. It's like a symbolic gesture. It's a symbolic gesture that you're going to end the troll fishery in Southeast Alaska in the Gulf of Alaska. You're going to end the troll fishery and I'll simply be like, they're back. Bah. You know what I mean? It's just not going to, it ain't going to be the thing that does it. Um, so here's another one that really hits me and Yanni right in the nuts. You ready for this, Yanni? I hope so. Uh, a listing for Wisconsin sturgeon. Oh. Center for our, our old friends at the Center for Biological Diversity. This is one of those organizations that's like, you know, a humane society. People think when they think of humane, HSUS, when people think of the Humane Society of the United States, HSUS, they think they're helping puppies that don't have a home. They don't realize that they're that it's a it's an anti-hunting animal rights organization and they confuse humane society local humane society shelters with hsus activities hsus is an anti-hunting organization that masquerades as like rescue puppies uh center for biological diversity is in large measure and and i i mean they're just reflexively anti-hunting and fishing. So the Center for Biological Diversity is petitioning to have lake sturgeon federally listed and subsequently uh, remove the right to fish and spear lake sturgeon. Now, the problem with this is people say that, that people would go, and even sturgeon managers in Wisconsin are saying, you're taking a sledgehammer approach to something that needs to be more surgical. Um, the Lake Winnebago sturgeon population should be used as an example of proper conservation. This is coming from a listener named uh, Taylor. Taylor and Aaron wrote in. The Lake Winnebago sturgeon population should be taken as an example of proper conservation. While it is understandable that certain sturgeon populations across the nation are low, the decision on regulations, hunting season, and protection should be left up to state and local entities to protect state and local resources. The Lake Winnebago sturgeon is thriving. This is backed up by countless annual surveys, tracking exact harvest of individuals, safe harvest caps generated using population models, and enormous amounts of research data collection. The Winnebago system lake sturgeon population is the most well-studied lake sturgeon population in the U.S. It was near extinction in the early 1900s from overharvest at a time when conservation was non-existent. Through diligent management and legislative action that enabled money raised through spearing license sales and donations to be directed only to sturgeon research and habitat improvement, the population grew to what it is today. It is spearing and angling that directly resulted in the recovery of the Lake Winnebago sturgeon. They go on to say that Yanni's even been there. Sounds like that whole North American model is it, working. It, it does. Yeah. I, I've had limited experience with that. I follow the, you know, you'll see postings of these big sturgeon that, that guys will take. And I think that probably generates a lot of, you know, activity within that crowd that Steve was talking about, you know, these sort of big dramatic fish dead but it seems like that's a oh very... yeah especially when you stick a big old seven yeah. prong spear it, through them yeah but it, my my impression that it's always been that's a very tight you know much in agreement with the letter that you got there that's a very tightly managed another fishery guy there yeah another guy wrote in about the same so another uh another individual ryan wrote in worked up about the same issue and he lays out the history too um a history that goes back to 1931 he said, Wisconsin was the first state to put protections in for Lake Sturgeon. And he didn't say this, but I'm saying also in plan with limited harvest. Okay. And, Stur and Wisconsin also is the birthplace of Sturgeon's Sturgeon for tomorrow. He goes on to say, our state, Wisconsin, has led the way to the restoration of the sturgeon, not only in our own waters, but in other states through sharing of spring spawning egg collections and our hatcheries being first to successfully raise sturgeon. 
Our Winnebago system has a dedicated lake sturgeon biologist who oversees the estimated population of 40,000 fish and sets the highly managed harvest caps for each February's 16-day season. He goes on to say losing our limited harvest. So they have an estimated 40,000 fish. They issue for the short season about 13,000 tags. They don't kill nearly that many fish because it's on a quota. Um, he says, you know, goes into the obvious effects of you're locking out public input. You're locking out public enthusiasm for a resource, public enthusiasm about how these anglers came together to restore this resource. Um, and folks aren't happy. She's another guy wrote in Nathan Kaiser. Um, same points. Want to hear us talk about it. I think we just talked about it. It doesn't sound like it's in danger. In a lot of places it is. It, okay, but in that particular yeah. instance, it's I not. think they got a case. I think they got like a case of, you know, I think they're not looking at it. Um, not giving Wisconsin credit where credit's due. Right. On restoring a fishery. Um, in a way that brings a lot of goodwill. Yanni can speak to it. Anyways, me and Yanni keep applying for these. I don't know how much money you and me put into that pile of money, but we've sweetened that pot up over the years. You guys wanted to go sit, uh, sit in one of the shacks and Well, we want to go to the upper I, lake. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that that application uh, has cost <laughs> that much money. So <laughs> we, we might be in for 100 bucks each, 100 bucks. maybe. Yeah. We want to fish the upper lake, and we're collecting bonus points. Yeah, yeah. we got another three, four years yeah, to go. Point yeah. It's a draw. Is, 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 the, is, the, is, the, is the upper lake a more desirable place yeah. to fish? Uh -huh. When uh, you draw uh, the upper lake, you're going to be in it. You're going to get a big one. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't even be talking about it. I know, because now, well, that's why I got a real axe to grind here, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, when I, I think I could tell you guys, when I, when I was in eighth grade, I took civics class, eighth or ninth grade, with a guy named Al DeYoung. You didn't tell me that. I never told you the story? I don't. The teacher was Al DeYoung, and he taught civics, and he taught it from the angle of, he would talk about, one, he would say, like, I would never take you kids down to register to vote, any kids, because why would I dilute my vote? He would say, I don't want you people to vote. Because I don't get people wanting other people to vote. I wish I was the only voter. And he would also say. <laughs> I like that logic. Well, he was, he was playing. I think he was looking back. I think he was being a little bit of a devil's advocate. But his slogan was, remember, when he's trying to explain government. He'd be like, remember. And he'd put his thumbs toward himself. He'd go, remember, I am concerned only with what affects Al DeYoung. <laughs> 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 and he would play like the thing where everybody hated him. But like looking back on it, I think he was like demonstrating a point as a teacher. You know, I'm concerned only with what affects Al Young. And this is this 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 Wisconsin deal. Just to lay it all out there, I want I don't, I don't want people I want people to know my biases. I have been steadfastly uh, trying to draw a sturgeon permit in Wisconsin. So um, years ago. We're gonna. I'll move on from the subject. But years ago, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying it's time to delist the grizzly. Okay, um, and I laid out all the reasons that for 20 years, uh, when they originally put protections in place for grizzly bears, they came up with they. Everybody sat at the table. They said, "What does recovery look like?" Uh, I wrote this op-ed six, seven, eight years ago. I don't know. At that point in time, those recovery objectives had been met for 20 years. So there had been 20 years of recovery, still no movement on delisting. Um, they, Wisconsin, or at that time, Wyoming was spending um, more on each grizzly bear in Wyoming than Idaho spends on kids in public school, right? Like, just it was time to delist the bear, which never got delisted. Uh, and in the, the, when I wrote the op-ed, they had turned up that I had hunted uh, that I had held grizzly bear tags for British Columbia and Alaska. So they're like, you have to admit in your op-ed that you um, have a vested interest because you have hunted for grizzly bears. They made me like point that out. So I'm here pointing out 
And I wasn't trying to hide it. It just didn't seem germane to the subject. So I had to say, like, as a guy who, you know, has in the past hunted grizzlies, I think they should delist grizzlies. Which the problem is then people read your op-ed and all they want to do is write you mean letters because you hunted grizzlies. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They want you to say this is for Steve. Yeah, but I'm just <laughs> only with what affects <laughs> Steve. So in pointing out that me and Yanni are deeply invested in our sturgeon tags, but I would feel the same way. But I would feel the same way. I should also point out that my kid caught a king salmon last year. Um, Yanni's not being a good podcast guest because he's very anxious to get back out hunting. You want to explain what's going on, Yanni? <laughs> yeah, according to my clock yeah. here, we have about 16 minutes until this thing needs Remaining. to end. <laughs> and we need, we need to go, go hit the coos deer woods. We're getting it's it. It's our uh, last day. Yeah. Dedicated podcast listeners will know that every year we do a podcast, we do an episode from Mexico. It's a tradition. And we come down and talk about what a great time we had, all the bucks we shot all the bucks we saw, how awesome it is. It's like traveling back in time. Today's the good old days. It's like someday people look back on Sonora coos deer hunting in the 2020s, and they'll talk about it like it'll be like mule deer hunting in Utah in 1960. It'll, it'll, it'll never be this good again. Yeah, never. It'll be what you look back on, right? It'll be, it'll be Eagle County, Colorado in the 70s. I don't know, right? Today, but not anymore. It's over. <laughs> it, ended. it was a good run. 2023 was the last good year. It's over. I don't know what happened. It's over. We have been pouring the coals to it. When we come down, we're in Sonora. We're further south than we've ever been before, I believe. We come down, and the mantra is a buck a day. And we gang hunt. We got a lot of people. And the goal is every day we find a shooter buck and get it. And if you do a buck a day, that's the formula for success. Day one, Paul, bam, off buck to, a day off to on a good schedule. Start, right, it's sitting right yep. there. Today we need to kill four. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this it, afternoon, and it is <laughs> raining. It's not right now, but there's another cell that's probably an hour or two out. Oh no, it's raining right now. Is it? It hasn't yeah. stopped uh, raining since we hit record. Is it raining out there, Gary? It's, it's yeah. Hon yeah. Dirt can't hear you because he's digging earwax out of his ears <laughs> to fix his lips. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a finger in each ear. He's got to dig deeper and deeper. <laughs> <laughs> you know when your chapstick runs out and you got to dig your fingernail down in there to like get the remnant that yeah. sits around that little prong in there? That's like digging into your ear. The same motion. <laughs> you get, you do it with your pinky gonna, nail. You get down he's going to have to start working with tools pretty soon. <laughs> I'm quit doing the ear digging ever since uh, Grace Sturdivant was on the podcast. Told us how bad it is to jam anything in there. I just let the earwax go now. I see you run around with a big old thing of Q-tips. What have you been doing with those? I didn't know it was harming Dude, my ears. Worst thing you could possibly do. Got it. It's right up there with uh, seed oils. <laughs> <laughs> and low T. Three big changes for Matt Cook in 2024. He didn't know he was low T. Yeah. Testosterone. I'm definitely low T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've learned a lot of things this trip. He didn't know he <laughs> was Making some changes. Making some changes. Yeah, he didn't know he was low T. He didn't know that furries are taking over public schools. <laughs> And and he, people and have kitty that, litter boxes in the in the classroom. And he didn't know that you're not supposed to be digging around in your ear on <laughs> Q-tip. Yeah. I'm going back with an agenda. I'm making some changes. Yanni, do a quick wrap up on the Mexico hunt. I've been talking a bunch about it's about the news. it's been a tough week, uh, tough conditions. I think our uh, our buddy Jay wants nothing more than to see us be successful. We can agree on that, right? Correct. He's, Jay, has, Jay has always yeah. treated us exceptionally yeah. I'm well. I'm 100% sure, and I'm sorry for all of Jay's other clients, but I'm 100% sure that we get a teeny tiny little bit of preference. Um, well, because we've been, we've been in it from the get-go. I know. Yeah, you're repeat been, clients. You're right. It's, you're right. Guy down we're, we're, ten, we're 10 years in. I'm just saying, we get a little bit of preference. We used to work for the guy. All, all true, all true things. <laughs> I'm just setting it up okay, as yeah, yeah. I feel you're like you're jumping to the end, and I'm trying to explain. I feel yeah. like we're in, we're at a prime coos deer 
hunting ranch. Mm -hmm. They guided here for a few years before they uh, went to letting DIY guys come here. And I think we're like the third or fourth DIY group here. And uh, yeah, we've caught a terrible week where it sounds like the rut is not happening Mm -mm. anywhere in Sonora this week. Uh, The weather has been terrible for coos deer hunting coos yeah, deer we've, hate we, we, we've had wind. tremendous winds yeah. you, you know at times yeah. the the optics are shaking so bad on the tripods looking back really... on it i think day one it was beautiful was yeah. really the only yeah. full perfect day that we had and we saw we, tons of deer no wind no rain big drought right Is yeah that all the local drought stricken landscape that not broke, today that broke, that broke today, today. <laughs> the drought ended today mm-hmm. i think it's interesting that we're hunting like in a, a valley that has a massive food source at the bottom, which is different than Irrigated, what we've done in the past. Yeah. I've Irrigated never been around any kind of food agriculture. source that, you know, creates, it, you know, with that, with the drought. We hunted a place once that had those wheat fields in the bottom. Remember yeah, that? Yeah, but they weren't irrigated, were they? They might have done some flood irrigation out yeah, of them. Yeah, probably. Yanni had a great point about why the rut, it's obvious that if you're having rut activity, it's just going to be better. But here, here's the very particular thing that makes it better. Would be, the ch- they're so hard to find. They, even when you know, like, let's say you know two deer are, you're looking at a hillside, you're looking at a mountainside, and you know there's two deer on the mountainside. Because you saw them. You, you saw them, so you're looking at them. You see them. Most of the time, you don't, you can't see them. Right. right, like if you watch two feeding deer for an hour, I don't know, you never figured out, but I would say like on average for forty minutes of that hour, you can't, you don't, you can't see them. Yeah, maybe more in the brush, whatever. If they're in the brush, right? They just they vanish. They're the gray ghost. Um, and then sometimes you see them, and even where you find one, and then you lose it, and never. We had it happen yesterday. I watched a deer go up onto an open hillside, and took my eyes off it to look at a buck that. I saw below it, went back to it, could never locate it. So in that little bit of time, it had it did something, bedded down, went out of my view. I don't know. They, they vanish. The saving grace is you're able to detect movement. And if you watch a group of two or three does or four or five does, whatever, and they got a buck or two, that buck's chasing them. The buck gets close to them, the does run. The buck is close to them, the does run. The buck gets close to them, the does run. So when you're glass in a hillside, there's something to like, there's something happening to, to make a movement. And the movement is what you see. Then you find a doe. You're like, oh, shit, a doe. And then you watch and you realize, not just that. Oh, I just saw an ear move up behind it. I just saw this happen. Little things you would never know if you hadn't gotten a focal point of activity. Case in point is yesterday, we knew about dirt, spotted two does, a doe bedded, he spotted a doe feeding and a doe bedded next to it. A doe got up and fed, laid down. That doe vanished for an hour. And we knew right where it laid down. You would never have known it's there. The other deer got up, shuffled, and laid back down in the same spot. When it laid back in the same spot, you couldn't find it. Eventually, those deer get up. And I even say to dirt, I'm just gonna, our own, this is our only thing. I'm going to follow that deer, that lead doe with my binoculars. And following that lead doe with my binoculars, I see a mountain lion come and set up out ahead of it to try to kill it. When that mountain lion finally jumps, it jumps, and there's a deer I never knew about. A forky buck came squirting out of this bush that we never knew about until it came out because a mountain lion tried to grab it. That's like how much you miss or see. It's hard. Last year, uh, we found Phelps's buck when a smaller buck was chasing does and then a bigger buck stepped out and you know fought him ran him off and took the does i mean you never would have known the bigger buck was there unless the rut activity it was 1500 yards away you know up on the side of the mountain we had no idea the profile of all those deer lured him out and (laughs) it, it brought out even multiple other bucks that are attracted to that activity and what was nice is that that activity going on allowed Phelps to be able to sneak up there. They were busy. Yep. He could make plays. And in the absence of that, they're all just laid under a tree. Yeah. <laughs> and you see zero. <laughs> or, I mean, last night, this morning, we seen, what, tw- between the, our group, 25 does last yep. night, 20 plus does today, not a horn in the group. Yep. So it's like, man, at some point, mature does everywhere. They have like, to be watching. The you just can't see them. 
Yeah. They're just pushed back up in there somewhere. I told Corinne this morning, I said, we're not going to make a show. We're not going to record a show today. Or I, that's not how I put it. I said, what happens if we don't make a show today? And she said, you'll be fine. Just focus on hunting. And, and, and then it started raining so bad. We came and made the show. So you people should be pretty happy with yourselves <laughs> having the <this> show. <laughs> <laughs> Comes at great, tremendous sacrifice. <laughs> It's it was what, cool seeing that lion, though. Yeah. I don't, there's not, I've only glassed it. That was probably the closest lion I've ever glassed up. I think it was around 1,000, 1,200 yards to me. What was cool is when I first saw it is that I was just glass. I just moved, and I could see kind of lower towards the river than I had earlier. So I'm looking at this specific zone, and all of a sudden it walks into my field of view, and I'm panning along with it, and all of a sudden it stops, and literally 10 yards above it, maybe 15, there's a coos deer standing there that I had not seen up to that mm-hmm. point. So again, it took me like focusing on something else to all of a sudden see this deer standing there. They're una- unaware of each other. The lion's looking like across the hill. The doe is looking straight up the hill, but she somehow senses the presence before the lion senses the deer's presence. She turns around, looks at it and goes, oh shit. And then <laughs> takes bounding off. And what was funny is, I don't know if it was like an optical illusion of being so far away or what, but there was like this delay where you would think as soon as she made two bounds, the cat would be like, oh, I heard something right there. I should go after it. But instead, she gets 50, 60 yards away. And then the cat's all of a sudden like, oh, what was that? And starts going uphill kind of in that direction. Really? Yeah. Do you believe know. me when I tell you that, I, that, that there was two? Sure. Why not? I don't know. No. You would... I saw you know, two. You, you know what you saw. There's just no way that the one could have gotten around. Dirt, do you back me up on this? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You just saw it? Yeah. What are you eating, Dirt? Yeah. Burrito. <laughs> Burrito. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where was the bobcat? <laughs> it's getting wet. Uh, it is yeah, wild here. For... Huh. Um, Big old yeah, bobcat. Yeah, seeing the mount, seeing mountain lions is, is 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 a lot of fun, and seeing them try to strike a deer is a lot of fun. Yeah, you sure don't get to do that every day. I think no. in in twenty years of guiding, I maybe saw five lions that were not treated with dogs, just mm-hmm. incidental to hunting. It, uh, I had an experience one time very similar to you guys. I I, I saw a, a couple of cow elk in a meadow, and I could all of a sudden sense they were very alert, looking below, and I was archery bow hunting at the time for elk. And of course, then I, as soon as I saw the cows were focused on something below, I thought, well, there's a good chance maybe there's a bull coming. And uh, just moments later, a, a big Tom lion came sprinting straight uphill across this meadow after him. But they they were already onto him, and they were uphill. So the minute he cleared the brush, psh, they were gone, and they beat him out. And then I got to watch this lion, just great. I had a spotting scope on him, just beautiful. And he jumped up, and he got on a flat spot. And he was sitting there and his ears were down and his tails just flicking. And you could oh, tell really? he was a mad cat. You know, his like, dinner was gone and he wasn't going to yeah. catch him. But uh, the bad part of that, I had a little solo tent and I was about 200 yards camp below where that Tom was. And then I had to go back and think, now there's a hungry lion wandering around here and I've got to go sleep at night down there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I never saw him again. It was interesting to watch this one work that doe is uh, – and now once that little forky came out, I don't, I don't, maybe my interpretation of what was going on, but he was above her and she was angling up the hill and he moved and got in the line of travel and laid down. Huh. And when he was moving, he's like very obvious, you know, just this orange blur going across. And then he yeah, stopped and interesting how down. orange those cats yeah, look. Yeah, they look real orange. And you notice like the black feet too. He yep. was walking yeah. that those black feet were very noticeable they no. look huge his feet look huge all right we better get back out there the last push i was wishing i had mingus with me oh you'd had a hot track buddy you'd had nowhere to tree it no no <laughs> if we would have ended up in a bait up situation well unless it unless it, that thing knew to head toward the sycamores well, sycamores were, you know what? Even that oak that we were huddled under, that uh, they could have gotten in that. They could have gotten in that and gotten high enough away that the dog couldn't get to it. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining everybody. We're gonna get back out and try one last little try. What's the forecast, Seth? Rain. <laughs> <laughs> two hours. Rain. Two it's a hundred. Two more. I thought I was supposed to get better. At I thought I was supposed no, to get no. two more. No. 
Is it, is it actively raining right now? It's a hundred percent. It's a it's a hundred percent, but it, now it's saying at least that the accumulation is only like point oh one. Well, the other thing is the ceiling. The ceiling lifted. Yeah, it lightened up. It's yeah, they, deer up, are gonna yeah. be on their feet right now. Yeah. Oh, Phelps. Before we Phelps go, says it's time to go. Yo, Phelps. Before we go, though, give us a quick update. Uh, Phelps game calls. What to look forward to? How's my moose tube coming? It's it's working. We, are you liking it? We, yeah, we uh we had to make a little change. We were trying to do it like handmade. It just wasn't going to be. We could make one a day, and it's just not not scalable. So <laughs> I don't want that. Jo- I don't want that job. <laughs> we did some glass filled <laughs> nylon. We're going to make some changes to that, and then we got some new updates to the deer call lines coming. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm. You're not too. You're not too like worked up about the moose call. It's pretty. It's like well, it's just not a lot of it's not, not a lot passion. of customers. It's not like, your passion project, is my yeah. good buddy Matt, who's better at business than me, would say like not a lot of profit and and a lot of not a lot of. You're down on moose calls. No, just just the scalability. <laughs> no, I told him you got to pick something where you're going to sell a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of moose calls. Make a lot of money. Making, yeah, one, yeah. making <laughs> one, making one for Steve <laughs> doesn't pay the bills. So, no, because I didn't buy it either. Which That's is really, true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're making some changes there. We got some deer calls. I'm really excited for 25, which is we're planning. You know, years and years out. 24 will be cool though, but like 25 is like a lot of new stuff coming, which is a long ways out. But excellent. Um, we're working on this. Uh, I want Phelps. Dude, turkey he's, he's gonna do me a pot call where on the pot, on the 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 artwork is a turkey giving you the finger <laughs> with a turkey hand. It's called the bird. <laughs> the great. artwork yeah. turned out awesome. Yeah, the artwork turned out awesome. You claim that copyright right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's not like it's hard to run it in laser engraver. No, but it's, you gotta, you gotta. I mean, that's hard to come up with an idea like a turkey giving you the finger. Actually, not because it's a quite common bit of taxidermy. taxidermy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my daughter has one. We do them like that. If, if you want to do it, you take your take your turkey. Next time you kill a turkey or your kid kills a turkey, take a rubber band and bend its two fingers down so its middle finger is sticking out. Um, rubber band the two fingers down as it dries. Just make sure you straighten that middle finger up a little bit and cock its wrist. So from you listeners that you people watch on YouTube, here's his arm. You cock him up, go like this, put a rubber band here and just dunk it in a, uh, in some borax for a few days or not. Depends how patient you are. And then eventually you get yourself a little wooden circle, um, a little plaque and you drill a hole in it and you run a screw up through the bottom into the leg and you set it on your desk and then it's a turkey giving you the finger. (laughs) Or you hang it but up. When you, I don't s- care. when you sit on your desk, is the bird then going straight up in the air? Yeah, you got to look down on it for the full effect. My mother in law. the idea, though. My mother in law sent all of my there kids oh, an, uh, 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 uh. the finger emoji, you know, at Thanksgiving. It said, Happy Thanksgiving, but she couldn't tell that it was a finger. She thought it was a turkey. And sent it, sent it to the oh. whole My mother in law. My kids are like, you know, grandma's, you know, gears are slipping a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they thought, was, they thought she maybe. thought it was a turkey. You know, happy Thanksgiving. Maybe she's a meat eater listener. She's Don't. a meat eater listener. She knows about the Michigan hello. She, she absolutely hello. is. Where I come from, that means what's up. All right. Thanks, everybody. We're going to go. All we're right. going to go out. Hot in time. Riding my horse in a town. Don't get in a hurry Since you ain't around The creek's high as it's ever been Here a blue quail will call To warn all his friends That my shot hooves are stomping his ground Riding my horse to town Searching the garden for life An absence of love makes it harder to find Thought I'd pick it all through today A fresh set of eyes finds more beans so you'd say An imaginary you by my side Searching the garden for life Your affection for me 
Like a flash in the pan Lasted only as long as our flame Darling, we all know how that story ends So I'll write my blues go away I'll write till the end of the day Spend all night picking guitar The fresh smell of leather makes me think you ain't far But your mindset on things much too fine Then a country boy like me can design I cast wishes on every star Spend all night Picking guitar Your reflection for me Like a flash in the pit Lasted only as long as our flame And darling, we all know How that story ends so I'll write till the end of the day I'll write till the end of the day